Welcome to the next episode of Assistant On Air. In this season, we focus on several games created for smart display games and featured the designers and developers who created them. Today, we're looking at the opportunities available for developers for smart displays and also some next steps that developers can take to improve their Google Assistant games. I'm Leon, and I'm your host for today. I'm a developer relations engineer for the Google Assistant. Today, I'm joined by our product manager for games, who is leading the Assistant Games effort. Hi, John. Hey, Leon. Thanks for having me. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself and why are you in the gaming space? Games have been a passion of mine since as long as I can remember. When the NES first came out, I, I, uh, I was entranced by the entire space. And I actually spent over 10 years of my career in games prior to joining Google. Um, most of my time was focused on emerging platforms when social first came out, when web games first came out, uh, when VR first came out. They were always sort of my passion to, it was always sort of my passion to focus on innovative technologies and create delightful experiences for those platforms. Actually, that's why I think the assistant platform is such an exciting space to be in. And I can't, I can't wait to see what type of content we can actually create with, with our unique technology. Great. So why is this a great time for developers to create games for smart displays? Yeah, it's a great question. Smart Display's adoption rate has continued to grow over the course of the past two years, and we see no reason why this will decline. Um, in fact, I, I think this really, uh, at the heart of it, is providing um, a brand new way for users to engage with content holistically. Um, while we're still in the early stages of figuring out how exactly users can engage here, we have identified three unique aspects of the platform that we think that game developers should really take advantage of. Um, the first is, is that the smart displays actually provide a visual experience to what otherwise traditionally on Assistant has been a voice forward uh, or a voice only experience. Um, we still would like this combination of having a voice input be the primary input in which a user engages with the platform. However, having a visual output really unlocks a brand new way for us to create content that the users can interact with. Second, these smart displays are, actually, are common area devices with a mobile phone you often have a much more personal experience and you carry it with you throughout the course of the day. However, these smart displays are, are often in common areas. They're in kitchens, they're in living rooms, and users traverse through these areas multiple times over the course of the day. So we, we look at these as more common area devices and allow for more communal type of experiences. Finally, the smart display is ambient. It's always on. It's always something that's sort of in your background. And we don't expect users to really be parked in front of a screen consuming two hours long content, although it does happen occasionally, we are seeing that they traverse and, and engage with these devices throughout the course of a day. And so creating some type of, of experience where users are, are, we're creating persistent content where users are able to engage throughout the course of a day with the content, seems like there might be a unique um, a, a unique facet on these devices for, for developers to build. Yeah, those are really unique features that I think most developers aren't aware of. Now, as a platform, we've been launching new games, uh, tooling and features. And um, can you talk through some of them and how they've been used by some of our top games for smart displays? Yeah, definitely. Um, our, the foundational technology here for smart displays is Interactive Canvas. Um, and it's been out for about a year, but it enables developers to create visual experiences using web technologies that most developers already know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, and, and that's really the foundation of creating these visual experiences. The past year, we've really been focused on creating tools that allow developers to build bespoke visual experiences. If you take a step back and look at how we built experiences on speakers, Everything was conversational. You always had a turn-by-turn -turn type of uh, relationship with the device. When the user spoke, then the speaker had to speak back before the user could be prompted. When you look at smart displays and look at screen devices, that changes dramatically. We can actually have a rolling type of it, rolling content on the display that allows the user to actually have freeform access. Our technology called Continuous Match really unlocks the potential of utilizing your voice when interacting with a visual surface. In the one of our recent games that we launched called Guess the Drawing, they designed a mode in which they show the act of drawing um, a, a, an image on the screen, and then users have to guess it. Rather than having to prompt the user to suggest what the answer might be over and over again, or having the user chime in by having to say, OK, G, uh, to, to open the microphone, 
we actually have the microphone open for the duration of the drawing, and they can just shout out answers and see if they can get the answer right. This mode is something that is uh, that we feel like has a lot of potential and is very well attuned to creating visual games. Uh, Mime Jam actually takes advantage of this as well. You'll notice that you didn't actually have to say OKG in order to say the answer. You could just simply say got it and shout it out at any given time. Yeah, continuous match mode is unique to our platform and it really opens up opportunities for word games to become much more engaging. Now, there are lots of existing games that might or might not make sense for smart displays. So for these existing games, how should developers think about the opportunities on smart displays? Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, you know, voice is a brand new interface and it may not always make sense for a particular genre or type of game to be ported. Uh, for example, action games or any game that sort of require a very precise touch uh, may not be a particularly good fit. However, if you take a step back and you, you look across the broad spectrum of, of casual games that are out there, there's a significant portion of games that actually might make sense where voice could actually be a better interface. If you look at word games, for example, um, and where the input of what you're trying to create is act to trying to input is actually words, that actually might be a better interface for you to actually play it on a smart display where, where, where your voice is what's inputting it. There could also be puzzle games where what you're trying to create, uh, while, while there's a visual puzzle that may not necessarily be word-centric, the answers that you're trying to uncover are actually words. And, and so these are potentially really seamless ports that might work really well on smart display. Beyond that, there are some games that might take advantage of the ambient nature of these devices. For example, idle RPGs and virtual pets aren't really high touch experiences, but on other platforms, they, they really take advantage of how you would want strategically to issue commands to a party or how you might want to uh, talk or engage with your virtual pet. A voice adaptation would not be a necessarily a direct port, but it might be pretty, it might not be a huge leap to figure out what type of voice commands you might want to make when you're strategizing what your party is supposed to be doing or how you're engaging with a virtual pet. However, at the end of the day, we also think that with this unique combination of, of where the device lives and the voice and visual technologies, that there is an opportunity to create bespoke experiences that really couldn't even exist on other platforms. This is where I think I'm excited to see what the ecosystem will bring. Yes, that's really good advice. Now, one thing we've learned is that launching and marketing games isn't enough. Games really need to keep players engaged and keep making them come back for more. So what kind of re-engagement ideas can you share with developers? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, on mobile, there have been techniques that have been used by developers and honed over the course of the past decade to, to really figure out what the right type of engagement is uh, correct for that platform. And But we're pretty early in on, on the smart display days. And, and so I don't know if we have the right answers today, but I can certainly share some best practices for how users are actually currently engaging um, with experiences on smart displays. Um, first, we're, as I mentioned before, we're not seeing users engage with these devices for extended periods of time. Usually they're, they're transient through the common areas where they're engaging with this content. And so building engagement, re-engagement techniques that respect that play pattern is something that we seem to be more successful by creating bite-sized experiences that are five to 10 minutes, um, whether it's a word puzzle or whether it's a visual puzzle like in Guess the Drawing. Um, these are these challenges where the user engages multiple times throughout the day and multiple days throughout the, the month are what we've seen to be pretty successful. So we know that monetization for developers is really important for their business goals. Now, as a platform, we have been improving the tooling and features around that um, to help developers grow their brand on the Google Assistant. So, John, can you talk about how some of these tools have been used by some of our popular games on smart displays? Yeah, actually, one thing that people don't necessarily realize is that we actually have a full suite of monetization tools already on the platform. And we are we enable digital transactions as well as subscriptions on the platform. And so uh, developers do have a set of tools that, that are ready to make sure that they can get positive ROI for, from building on the platform. Um, however, I think with any type of new platform and when transactions are being done by voice, there is some uncomfortability for for, develop, uh, for users to, to try to engage with that technology. And so we're continuing to make platform improvements to increase, to decrease the friction for the user in, in going through that journey. 
Um, that said, I think from a best practices perspective, at least currently in the ecosystem, um, subscriptions seem to be working a little bit better because users are somewhat more unfamiliar with transacting with their voice, setting up something where the users can subscribe to, to a service and that service continues to provide value over the lifetime of their engagement with the game seems to be a better way to create sustainable value, both for the user as well as for the developer. Now, this will continue to change as the platform continues to evolve and as users get used to this type of transaction, um, we'll, we'll keep you posted as, as to how um, how best to to continue to drive that ROI and and uh, build sustainable content on the platform. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today, John. Thanks for having me, Leon. So if you want to try out the games we've been highlighting this season, check out the links below. Thank you for watching.